If you listen to many figures in the mainstream media, mostly Democrats, some Republicans who never got on board the Trump train, they will tell you that Donald Trump is the first American president to ever demean his office by his conduct and that he is a great aberration in a sea of truly honorable and upstanding men who would never betray the trust of the public or engage in dishonesty or bullying. And they're completely and totally full of shit. In 1800, the first true presidential election after George Washington's retirement, Thomas Jefferson and John Adams ran against one another, and their discourse was so enlightened that one of them accused the other of being a child molester. So, yeah, it's a pretty well-established tradition that presidential candidates and presidents can say some pretty awful things. And it's also become more standard in recent years for presidents to send out messengers to do that kind of stuff for them and to distance themselves from it but still get the impact of saying such things. And all modern presidents have engaged in these kinds of things. The difference between Trump and the rest is that Trump does it himself and usually on Twitter, which I think is more of a distinction than a difference. But at any rate, one person who's benefited from this massively has been George W. Bush, who 53% of Democrats now say that they approve of, and they act as if, yeah, you know, Trump was all of these horrible things. He's a you know xenophobic racist, but Bush, you know, whatever you think of him, he was actually a pretty okay guy. Well, today we're going to take a look at that, and we're going to take a look at the kind of rhetoric that Bush promoted and how it damaged national discourse and also had some impacts on national policy, all of which were for the worse. In November of 2008, Barack Obama won the presidency, and then in December, George W. Bush was packing his bags and about to go home. His last priority as president was not dealing with the recession or the housing crisis, though. It was dealing with his own legacy, which was clearly in the shitter. So his approval rating by this point was a really low percentage, like maybe low 20s. It was not great. And he and his chief political strategist, Karl Rove, knew that Bush would not be remembered kindly by history and that to get him anywhere near normal, they would really have to promote him heavily and to defend his actions at every possible step. So... Karl Rove was placed in charge of the Bush Legacy Project that they formulated officially in December of 2008. And basically what it is, is it's an effort to rehabilitate Bush and defend all of his actions. Never admit fault and just come up with justifications and pretend that what you did was in good conscience and for the betterment of the nation. The George W. Bush Presidential Library was designed with this in mind. It basically lays out all of his major foreign policy decisions and explains why Bush was right to do this and why anyone who would disagree was wrong. And it only provides facts that are good for Bush's case, so it's not really any kind of intellectual exercise or anything that has any educational value. It is simply propaganda for George W. Bush. And even before this December 2008 meeting, Karl Rove was trying to polish Bush's image. Back when he was running for president, Bush ran as an anti-intellectual, said he wasn't a big fan of reading. But then, mysteriously, as he was president and he had zero free time, uh, Karl Rove claims that Bush became an avid reader and that he and Bush competed to see who could read more nonfiction books and that both of them were reading books by the dozen and that Bush would brag to him about all the books he had read, about Genghis Khan and Napoleon. And it was a clear case of bullshit because George W. Bush has never read a book in his life, at least not voluntarily. Famously, he was against reading memos that were more than two pages. So, uh, yeah, I seriously doubt he'd sit down with a thick tome on Napoleon's campaigns. Anyway... Bush's greatest opportunity to distinguish himself finally came when Donald Trump took office. Now, before this, Obama hadn't really given him any obvious openings. Some Republicans would 
harken back to the Bush years and say, well, he's better than this guy we got now, but he still sucked. And now with Trump, Bush can look around at his establishment friends and say, see, I wasn't that bad. And apparently he is prone to snicker sort of makes me look good, doesn't it, when he sees that Trump is dysfunctional and that his cabinet is a revolving door of lunatics. So, Bush's agenda is very clear. He wants to promote himself as a defender of civility, and the best way to do that is to define civility as the president not getting down and dirty and letting his subordinates do it for him, therefore making him a better president than Trump. So, let's talk about all of the things that George W. Bush did to cheapen our national discourse. Let's begin at the beginning, as it were. This won't be a comprehensive look at George W. Bush's failures and foibles when it comes to degrading the national discourse, but hopefully we'll hit most of the highlights. So, in 1994, he officially embarked upon his political career in earnest when he ran for the governor of Texas. His opponent was Democrat Ann Richards. Bush's platform was pretty right-wing. He was running on tort reform as one of his four or five major planks. And as you might imagine, most people don't give a shit about protecting corporations from mass lawsuits when those corporations wrong them in some way. But anyway, this was back in the 90s when Republicans thought that tort reform was sexy. And as you might imagine, it wasn't going super well, and Ann Richards was a pretty strong candidate. So what Karl Rove did is spread rumors that Richards might be a lesbian in conservative East Texas. Richards' strength as a candidate was that she was promising to help make sure that the state government reflected the diversity in the state. Texas, is, of course, is a fairly diverse place, and she appealed to most demographics. However, Rove saw that as her strength, and he developed a strategy to attack the opponent's strength and turn it around. So basically, to use something like reverse psychology, although Rove would take this and hone it into a fine art, as we'll see time and again. Bush, of course, won the Texas governorship, and that made him a nationally recognized figure and enabled him to put his name in the hat for president going into 2000. During the 2000 Republican primary, the contest came down to George W. Bush versus John McCain. And in New Hampshire, the second contest, John McCain won bigger than expected. He won about 48 to 30, with all the other random candidates coming in way behind. And this apparently panicked the Bush campaign. So leading up to South Carolina, which Bush felt he had to win, after all, Bush was running as the Southern candidate, he had to throw in the kitchen sink. So, Bush campaign manager Karl Rove began to spread stories through third parties all over the state, and he left no punch on throne. He spread stories that McCain, due to his war experience, was having psychological issues and had anger management problems because of his experience in Vietnam. He also spread a rumor that John McCain's wife was a drug abuser, and that this would be a major distraction for McCain if he were to be elected, that he would have to deal with his wife constantly relapsing and using drugs. And he also spread a weird story with no basis at all that McCain had a black love child somewhere. So these things were highly effective in South Carolina and led to Bush's victory. So what is it that Rove was trying to accomplish? Well, once again, he was attacking McCain's strengths. McCain was a veteran in Vietnam, and he was a fairly highly distinguished one. So rather than try to compare Bush's record as a draft dodger with McCain's record as someone who spent time in Hanoi as a prisoner, what Rove did was say, yeah, you know, McCain went to Vietnam, and now he's a complete lunatic. Because there was one pervasive uh, idea in America at one point that all of the Vietnam veterans had gone crazy over there. So this was playing into that prejudice and once again stigmatizing veterans and stigmatizing people with mental health, while also not even proving that this applied to McCain. Then, um, to distract from Bush's past with alcohol, they talked about McCain's wife and her drug abuse. 
because apparently having a spouse or relative with a drug problem is worse than having a problem yourself. But at any rate, people stopped thinking about the fact that Bush had been an alcoholic for many years um, and started talking about McCain's wife having had some issues. The black love child, though, may have been the kicker because this showed that Karl Rove truly understood the really fucked up racial politics of the Deep South. In fact, McCain had an adopted child from somewhere in South Asia who was probably fairly dark. But in the South, especially places like South Carolina, Mississippi, wherever, there's not a lot of nuance when it comes to race. There's black and white. And people vote accordingly. If you go in any of these states and you look at how people vote, pretty much all the white people there are Republican, all the black people are Democrats. Um, so by making McCain someone who may have a black love child, basically Bush was smearing him as a liberal or as a secret race traitor. So this was just race baiting 101, and it played into the basest possible instincts of the people in that state. So, again, you know, this is Bush really lifting our national discourse and teaching civility by smearing his opponent rather than beating him with ideas or with a superior platform. In the wake of 9-11, George W. Bush was tasked with dealing with a problem that went far beyond his limited intellectual capacity. And to be fair, this was a crisis of portions great enough to you know, really pose a challenge to anyone. To Bush's credit, the one thing that he did well was to draw a distinction between Islam and Islamic terrorist, and to say that someone being Muslim does not necessarily make them a terrorist. And you might think that's a pretty damn small distinction, except that there are still people, including people like Sam Harris sometimes, who will say things like, look, you know, this is a fundamentally flawed religion and we really need to call it out. The thing is, if you're a president and you have to conduct diplomacy, saying something like that will really deter any potential allies and would be completely stupid. At any rate, though, uh, that's the one thing Bush got right, to give him a little bit of credit. Where he really fucked up and did damage, though, is that he used this new mandate to fight terrorism to threaten Iraq, Iran, Cuba, Syria, and North Korea. Between the five of them, they had literally nothing to do with 9-11. So this was demonizing these random countries and then getting all of his supporters, which at this time these, these people were many, um, after 9-11 his approval rating shot up and many Americans, especially Republicans, really rallied behind him and parroted everything he said. So he said that these countries were evil, therefore people on the street would tell you these countries are evil and they need to be dealt with. And Bush promoted a brand of militarism which normalized and rationalized intervention, torture, and regime change, and had half the country spouting neoconservative talking points. Fox News turned into the war promoting station. All they did was saber rattle about who we're going to bomb next and how awesome it's going to be. So this was something that did a ton of damage to our nation's discourse. And right now, this kind of rhetoric is out of fashion. Um, even a lot of Trump supporters, if you were to go to like their subreddit, will say that they do not support war. And it's because Bush pushed this so hard and we got our fair share. That being said, one thing that we'll talk about in the future is how Bush's war policies have actually been carried on by both Obama and Trump without any substantive change. But again, we'll get to that when we get to that. When dealing with countries that were ostensibly American allies, and also when talking to members of the Democratic Party who were the opposition in America, Bush used a rhetoric of with us or against us, a very black and white, unnuanced, unthinking way to look at the world. And this again carried on to all of his mindless drone followers who thought that he was this heroic president standing up for America. When France opposed the invasion of Iraq rightfully, the Republicans started calling French fries freedom fries and it became very commonplace to bash the French as not being good allies. The thing is though, uh, they were right. There was no reason to go to Iraq. 
but we win anyway. Bush's lackeys on Fox News would then shout down anyone who opposed Bush's legal wars, warrantless wiretapping, etc. And one thing that they really loved to do was to question the love of country that these people possessed. Remember there was one Bill O'Reilly show where he had the son of a 9-11 victim on, and the son was saying, well, we shouldn't be doing the things we're doing in response to 9-11. That is not an appropriate response. And Bill O'Reilly basically told him that he didn't understand America or 9-11 and basically threatened to kick his ass. It's just that kind of shit that got really out of control during the Bush years. And that whole phrase, love of country, it's probably been around for a while, but it's also repeated by Trump people when they talk about why they support Trump as opposed to whoever else. And this whole idea of love of country basically just means talking about America and refusing to acknowledge any of its problems or refusing to acknowledge that America has made mistakes. Although Trump people do acknowledge that America made plenty of mistakes under Bush and Obama, which is you know makes it even that much weirder. But uh, we were talking about the Bush years, and during the Bush years, the thing was to ignore any and all flaws that America might have. If you criticized America for anything, and if you didn't have the biggest American flag pin lapel that you could find, you were just an unpatriotic piece of shit. Also, when I was a teenager, I had to wear a suit for some event, and this was a couple years after 9-11, and I remember, you know, like, my mom and grandma were trying to find me, like, the biggest uh, flag pin that was available, and, you know, it just kind of looked stupid having a flag pin that large on your lapel. It's kind of it's kind of overpowering and I don't know, I don't know about you guys, but I know when I was a teenager I always felt kinda of awkward and gawky in a suit. But uh you know, I don't think that helped very much and you know, having the little flag competition with everybody was a pointless exercise at best. In addition to all of the fear mongering that George W. Bush used in order to create the Department of Homeland Defense, warrantless wiretapping ice and a lot of other things that were completely and totally unnecessary, he also decided to ramp up the fear factor going into the 2004 election. Now this was hardly a new tactic, Reagan had done it, and so had Lyndon Johnson. And interestingly enough, their campaigns respectively were 1964, 1984, and now 2004. So maybe it's just a 20 year cycle of using complete and total fear mongering. At any rate though, Bush ran an ad called Wolves, where they're in the woods, and there's a bunch of fog, and they're talking about how the Democrats massively cut intelligence spending, and that this is just going to encourage all the wolves out there looking to get a piece of America to come in and fuck us over. And the ad specifies a $6 billion cut that John Kerry and the Democrats made. But what they don't tell you is when this cut happened, or exactly what all this money was for. So, they're referring to a bill that I think Kerry voted against back in 1994. And this was at a time when budget cuts for the military were happening, and the reason was obvious. The Cold War was over. America was ramping down its military and trying to reap a peace benefit. So... You know, this was something that most people agreed with except for the hard right Republicans. And they're making it out, by the way, that they're um, portraying it in this ad where they don't name the year that John Kerry after 9-11 is like, yeah, let's cut the defense budget and do away with intelligence altogether. We don't need that. Um, So it was totally dishonest. And what it helped to do was build up an impression that The Republicans have been trying to promote that Republicans are strong defenders of America because they love America and Americanness and the flag and the country and American values and American pie. Whereas Democrats are weak and naive and stupid and don't know what's going on and they just don't care. And, you know, it's like that general ridiculous idea but taken to its utmost point taken to a point that it's not at now and that it wasn't at before. Remember, JFK was a strong anti-communist, even though he was also a liberal. So people before George W. Bush understood that you can be two things at once, whereas in the Bush era, the rhetoric was so black and white that people forgot to think in 3D terms. 
you can't have a person with more than one or two character traits in the Bush era. So this, I think, was very damaging to our national discourse. And I never had a productive conversation with a Bush supporter during the eight years of his administration. All of them were completely impossible to reach because they were so fixated on a black and white worldview with zero nuance or logic. If you'll recall, one of George W. Bush's political liabilities in 2000 was his status as a draft dodger while trying to run against a war hero. And it probably was a smaller liability in a general election than it would be in a primary among Republicans, who many of whom actually still supported Vietnam. Uh, the thing is, though, John Kerry was emphasizing his record as a veteran in order to promote the idea that he would be a better and more responsible commander-in-chief for the quagmire that was starting to develop in Iraq. Well, Bush had to find a way to negate that advantage. So what he and Karl Rove did was set up an organization called Swift Boat Veterans for Truth, and their mission was to refute John Kerry's claims that he had made back when he had come home from Vietnam that swift boats were involved in war crimes. And they basically ran ads attacking John Kerry's claims, but also attacking his war record. Most of these guys had never served with them and had no idea who he was. Even Kerry was only a lieutenant back then. And they just kind of, uh, well, swift boated him. You know, they really attacked his character and made it out like his war record was complete and total nonsense and that he hadn't actually done anything. Today, the verb swift boating refers to unfair and untrue political attacks. And years later, right before they closed down their organization officially, the Swift Boat Veterans for Truth cleared Kerry of the charge that they had been trying to lay against him. And they said that actually, yeah, he had earned the honors that he um, said that he had, like the Silver Star. So uh, this was a deeply dishonest and horrible attack. And it also really dredged up the skeleton of Vietnam in a way that was messed up. Because once again, they played the, this patriotism thing. It's like, hey, we all acknowledge that Vietnam was a bad idea, but if you really don't support it and you don't support the actions the U.S. took in it, you're not a patriot. So once again it does this kind of psychological damage to the American mind where you're forced to choose between your country and this abstract sense of love and support and what you actually know to be right and wrong. So once again, you know, George W. Bush did his best to inflict psychological pain and suffering on the nation. It was around the time of the 2004 presidential campaign that I first heard the phrase, the gay agenda. And this gay agenda included such insidious things as gay people having the right to marry or being entitled to the same basic rights and privileges as everyone else. And the Republicans acted as if this was an unprecedented assault on America and that this was really going to undermine the basis of our morality and cause our society to cascade into complete and total chaos where people would just be fucking each other in the streets and engaging in lewdness and Western civilization would unravel. And promoting all this, of course, was George W. Bush. Karl Rove decided that abortion, while a good wedge issue and one that they would certainly utilize in 2004, wasn't enough. After all, Bush had allowed 9-11 and started a war of choice in Iraq, so, uh, if you're going to win, you need to really resort to some dark shit. So he decided to go after one of the least popular groups in America, the gay community. And this is at a time when the prejudice against the gay community was high. Uh, Matthew Shepard, of course, was killed in a hate crime. And one congresswoman, Virginia Fox, denied that his murder was a hate crime in front of his parents on the floor of Congress. And she still got reelected. Anyway, um, Dick Cheney, of all people, the most evil man in the Bush administration, was the only person who saw this as incorrect and wrong. But, of course, his reason was simple. He had a daughter who was a lesbian, 
And if you're a conservative, you can afford to be principled and have sense on one thing if it affects you personally. And for Dick Cheney, that has always been gay rights. So he's right about the issue, but only for purely selfish motives. And you know what? Uh, Bush went ahead. He's like, yeah, let's demonize a community that is discriminated against. Let's take advantage of them. Let's do to them what Nixon did to black people in the South. So, uh, Bush went right along, and he talked about how you have to defend traditional values and Christianity from the gays. And he tried and failed to pass a constitutional amendment to protect gay, uh, protect traditional marriage uh, when he was reelected, but that, of course, failed. Anyway, um, so when he goes on shows like Ellen and talks about civility and respecting one another and all that kind of stuff, we're talking about someone who tried to promote and take advantage of prejudice. So he really doesn't care about civility that much. It's nothing he's ever cared about. Um, he is being completely and totally disingenuous. And again, I stand by the idea that his idea of civility is that the president watches his words a little bit, but then sends out his goons to, you know, really lay the smack down. And Trump is unacceptable because he does the dirty work himself. Which, if anything, I think is actually an upgrade, but that's neither here nor there. Earlier, I mentioned that Bush has publicly decried the casual brutality of Trump's rhetoric. The big problem with that, though, is that Bush himself was just as guilty of casual brutality in his rhetoric, if not more so, than Donald Trump. And in fact, many practices that we have today that are enactments of casual brutality date back to the Bush administration. Drone strikes, for instance, were a Bush innovation. Um, now, granted, they would have happened under any president, but he sort of normalized them. Obama took it to a new level, and then Trump took it even further. But if you really want to see the origins, then Bush plays a big role in that. At any rate, though, Cheney was the administration's point man when it came to promoting torture and talking about how it works and how it's fine to do the terrorists because they're not covered by rights. Bush himself, though, did carry some water and went out and defended this practice. And even better, sometimes when it was damaging, he would just simply say, uh, we don't torture. I don't know what you're talking about. That's just an unsubstantiated rumor. We use enhanced interrogation. It's totally different. So he gaslighted. Um, which I think is actually worse than an honest defense of torture. Because with an honest defense of torture, you at least know what you're debating. And you don't have to have random Republicans parroting Bush's uh, talking points and then saying, but we don't use torture, the president said so. If you don't believe the president, you're not an American. And uh, Bush's best quote ever was in 2014, there was a torture site that was uncovered and we learned that Obama wasn't actually serious about dealing with torture. Surprisingly, though, Bush said that these CIA torturers were patriotic Americans and that they shouldn't be prosecuted. Of course, one of those patriotic Americans is Gina Haspel, who Trump then took as a known torturer and gave control of the CIA.